champion Iron Mike Tyson. We'll show you Mike Tyson unedited, full of rage and unwilling or perhaps unable to control his language. Tyson admits for the first time that he did bite Lennox Lewis during that press conference turned brawl earlier this year. He also talks about the women in his life, his children, and the legacy he hopes to leave the boxing world. One on one with Mike Tyson, next on Foxwire. This week, I traveled to Maui, Hawaii, where former heavyweight boxing champ Mike Tyson is training for what some say is the fight of his life. He's scheduled to box the current champ Lennox Lewis on June 8th in Memphis, and many are predicting this fight could generate the largest payoff ever in boxing history. We chose to interview Mike Tyson not only because of the upcoming match, but because he's probably boxing's most controversial figure both in and out of the ring. From the beginning, Tyson's life has been plagued with problems. As a child, he spent time in a juvenile detention center. In 1992, he was convicted of raping Desiree Washington, a beauty queen in Indiana. Until recently, he was banned from boxing because of his famous ear-biting incident where he bit Evander Holyfield during their match in 1997. Only a few months ago, at a joint news conference in New York with Lennox Lewis, Tyson seemed to fall apart. The press conference ended in a brawl, and Lewis accused Tyson of biting him in the leg, an allegation Tyson refused to respond to until now. Tyson shocked us during our interview this week when he admitted for the first time to biting Lewis, an admission that could cause still more trouble for him with boxing's ruling commission and legally with Lennox Lewis himself. During our interview, Tyson shocked us even more with his crude and racially charged language, something he is known for. Because of this, we as a news organization really struggled about whether we should delete the profanities and risk altering his message or let his message and his words speak for themselves. We want to warn you, this is not an interview children should see. This is Mike Tyson unedited on his tumultuous relationships with women, his use of antidepressants, and his upcoming bout for the heavyweight championship of the world. Again, the language and subject matter of this interview are not appropriate for children. Here now, we report on Mike Tyson. You decide. Let's talk about what this fight means to you. What is it? Does this mean everything to you, this fight on June 8th? Well, nothing's everything to me, but you know, this is a fight where we, um, me, my trainers, my sparring partners, you know what I mean? This is just a, it's one of those days that we all have to be one. If you, know you win mean? this fight, are you going to treat when the title with fight. respect? When I win okay, this fight. Okay, when you win this fight, are yeah. you going to treat it with respect? A lot of people said you came so close before and didn't treat it with respect. Respect. You going to treat the, the title with respect? No, because the title doesn't deserve to be treated with respect because it's, the title is like a woman. It's like love. It doesn't care about anything around it but itself. It doesn't care who possesses it. It still gets, it still receives whatever it receives. It receives the same as when I possess it, when he possesses it. It's always going to be loved. I'm not going to always be loved. The title's going to be loved to the day it dies, so he doesn't care about me or you. It's like a woman. Fuck you. I'm so beautiful, I can get the next man with more money, with a better body. He has a prettier waist for me to go around. What do you think of Lennox Lewis? Not do you, much. Does, do you respect him as an athlete? Huh? Oh, you, he's brilliant as an athlete, but I'm the man. He's come out, he said that you were a liar, that you, you went before the Nevada Athletic Commission and didn't tell them that you bit him in the leg. So he publicly came out and said you lied. What do you think of that? Sorry, I did bite him. What do you think of Lewis calling you a liar in public? I've been called worse things by better people than him. So it doesn't matter. What drives you in the ring? Is it money? Is it the love of the sport? What drives you? Shit, now, I don't know, man, but I really be, I don't know, I must be some kind of enigma, because I don't even know why I'm around this long, just doing this stuff. I'm just, um, part of it's money, part of it's greed, part of it's ego, you know, I'm just... Do you I, need the money? Huh? People say you need the money. Well, listen, man, I don't need the money as bad as some people think, but you know what I mean? I do need the money because, um, that's why it's called money, because we all need it. It's our God, it's what we worship, and if anybody tell me anything different, they're a liar. If they don't believe that money is important in the worship, don't work. Stop working. Just live on the street and show you how much God's going to take care of you. Where did these statements, these things that you said, like, I'm going to eat your children and the things at the press conference, where did they come from? Where does that rage come from? Oh, what is this rage? You're so white. You know, so <laughs> where does that rage come from? <laughs> Sounded did good, it? huh? No, where, but, but where, you know, some of these statements, people go, he sounds like an animal. Hmm? Are you an animal? Am I an animal? 
if necessary, it depends on what is, what what situation am I in? What what situation am I in to be an animal? Tell me, you tell me. If I'm if I'm fighting constantly from being assailed against um, your cohorts or people in the streets because they feel that they have um, the right to assail me because of what people write in the paper. Because of course, what you guys write and what you guys say, people feel that they. You're, you're correct and you're right and they feel they have the right to even um, say say what you said because I'm right because she said so that's right you are a fucking rapist you are a tree jumper you are a, an animal you are that and then know what's so funny because are you did I, you, no, you no, rape no, her no. did you rape her huh Desiree who did you rape Desiree Washington no Desiree Washington raped me okay but the fact is as I was saying before do not skip the subject if anybody continues to assail me you know, what am I to do how am I to fight you've said you're angelic, but you're scum. What do you mean? I say that in the 10th sense when I say, when you're at the bottom of the barrel of life and say, you know what I mean? I'm as low as any man could ever go. You know what I mean? But how because, could you be low? You're making millions of dollars. But that, that makes me low because how can anybody love you being as rich as I am? I mean, having as much money. I'm not the richest man in the world by far, but in my society, having as much money as I have, I've been fortunate to make a lot of money, unconsciously of it, you know what I mean, what it's really worth, but how could somebody truly love a guy like me that has all this money? How, no, really, really, how could you How could you ever get to know me in spite of everything I possess? How could you really, who would, ever, well, who would care who I am because of what I possess? You, some people would tolerate, you know, how could you truly love me? How can you really get to the essence of me? How can you really get to the essence of a man with millions or, or somebody like Billy? How can, like Rockefeller, how can you get to his essence when his essence is only money? How can he reach, he won't, your purpose is only to give him children. He may say he loves them, but a man worships money and loves money. He don't love no woman. But do you let people get to know you? I've talked to some of your friends who say you kind of shut them out. Do you let people get to know you? Why? Once I get once they get to know me, what they do now? What the, what the famili familiarity breeds? Contempt. Once you get to know me, well, he says, well, Mike ain't really all that. He can't handle this bitch situation. I got, you know, I can handle this nigga. He's stupid. I better get some of these hoes to get get paid off. These deal not to handle. This. People feel like they have they they want to spend your own money. They they want to be you. You know what I mean? So why should I let someone get close to me when they get familiar with me? And then they go say, God damn, look at his flaws. I thought he was this. You know what I mean? He's letting this girl hurt his heart. He's letting somebody piss him off over some pigeons. He's mad because he hit a cat and he's fucked up in the head now because he hit a cat or something. So what people look at that is weakness. So what people respect, I show them, people respect force. Pe people respect being assertive, and that's what I am, because they won't respect me for what I truly am. You can't respect me, because me being who I truly am, I'm relaxed, and when I'm relaxed, I'm, I'm egotistical, you know what I mean? I'm arrogant, so I control those feelings, because I know, even the people that associate with me, I know if I make money, the first thing I have to do for my experience, I must give it away. Hey, take some, take some, because that's how I make enemies out of my friends, to hoard it all and not share any. But who are you? People who know you say you got 10 personalities. You got an angry Mike, you got a, a good-hearted Mike who helps kids. Who are you? I don't know. I'm many people with many things, just like you. I know. I'm, so, I'm sure at times you're a lady in the streets and a whore in the sheets, and I'm just there's so many other things. You're many of things. What are you, a good sister? You're a good aunt, I'm sure. You're a good daughter, but you're many of things. You know what I mean? You're a pain in the ass to some people. To a lot of people. Well, yeah, but that's just who all of us are. But why is mine such extremes? Because I'm, I'm blessed to be on television or be in the paper, so why mine's got to be more? I, it's not like I have um, bipolar disorder or personality disorder. It's just that everybody that I admire, for some reason or another, I take a piece of them. You know, maybe Arnold Rothstein, maybe Jack Dempsey, Mickey Rourke, you know what I mean? Whoever it may be, Paul Robeson, Joe Gans, Frey Jolly, I just take a piece of them for certain situations. And I handle those situations accordingly, you know what I mean? For a defense mechanism, but you know, I'm just as normal as anybody else. You talk about physical too. Are you taking medication? You no, were I taking some I before. No, I don't, I wasn't taking medicine. I was very sick and I, I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't say I need medication, it wouldn't hurt, you know what I mean, because I'm a real high-strung type of guy. But just, I'm living in a society, just think about it, right? Um, 50 or 60 years ago, um, Hemingway didn't have um, whatever that they used, um, ecstasy or whatever I was taking, Prozac or whatever the situation, it wasn't actually Prozac, but whatever the drug was. So right? So off, yes. He didn't have that, so everybody thought he was a psycho, a racist, a maniac, but he was a mentally sick man. You Are know? you mentally sick? I don't know if I'm mentally sick, but um, I have sometimes episodes sometimes. I'm a, I'm a depressed individual. I have episodes, and I'm, I'm human, but no one cares about my um, 
my health as a human, you know what I mean? Because sometimes I'm in my episodes when I'm at work. Why are you so depressed? People look at you and say, you got, you're Mike Tyson, you got it all. You talk about the cars, the money, all that stuff. Have you ever been so depressed you thought about killing yourself? Well, that, that, um, that feeling goes through everyone's mind, I'm sure. And if it doesn't, I don't know, it must be crazy. Everyone thinks about that because sometimes, you know what I mean, it's just tough being a, it's tough being a nigga and it's tough being a bad nigga. You know what I mean? Yes, when. But you're a rich one. You got a lot of stuff. Yeah, you got a lot of people surrounding listen, listen, you. Listen, that adds to um, depression. That adds to the false sense of security. You know, I got to be around all these cats. I don't know who loves me. You know, I've been around cats. I've been in times where I've been around a guy for a long time, and I'm, I'm trifling at times. I've been around a guy, and I portrayed myself to be something I'm not to get what I want. And I'm not, and I'm not like these guys, because in my situation when I was younger, it was detrimental when I was being kind to somebody because at the end it was never a pretty sight. But I'm just saying it's just, I don't know, man. I mean, I, mean, I have issues just like everybody else. I, I probably, everyone probably needs help. I probably need to talk to somebody. But how could I talk to somebody that just looks at me and say, well, and then when I'm really getting ready to feel this guy and put my heart out, you know, um, go pay. Um, that it's business. No, you think no, it's business no, no. for them. Time's Please, up. See, no, let me explain. Okay, go ahead. Um, hold it, Mike. Um, I'm sorry. Um, Drop the um, two hundred dollars off at the desk of my secretary and make an appointment for me to come back next week. So it's a business. They no, don't care right, about no, no, you. No, 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 what you're no, saying. Regardless, we know that. But I'm getting ready to pour out my heart with this white motherfucker. He just got me comfortable, and I'm thinking he's real. And I'm just getting ready to pour out. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, let thought. Um, call the Mary, pay the two fifty, and make an appointment for next week. And we're gonna make we're gonna make some leeways, Mike. I see that coming. Now, do you have friends or people no, that you really trust you? No, no, but you listen, you, you cut that issue. Yeah, no, You're asking me questions. No, 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 I understand it's what you're saying, but what story. about friends? No, 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 what about it has friends? nothing to do with friends. Right then, I leave that place that was supposed to help me, and I leave there more fucked up I am when I, when I first went in there. And I say, is this a fucking game? You know what I mean? So I stopped going. You know what I mean? I stopped going. So now they put me on this Zoloft stuff, right? And I'm so, um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a really, um, I'm, I'm pathetic sometimes, I'm real shallow, I'm so dick conscious. Well, you know, I'm, I'm taking those off and I don't get an erection. Oh, I'm, I'm just gone then, man, I'm just gone. I'm just ruined and rotten then, man. And then you tell me I gotta still start taking this and I'm, a, I'm, I'm an extreme sexual type person. I gotta start taking this stuff and it probably is making me feel a little better, but you know, it's making me feel bad because I like the, you know, I'm, like I'm saying, I'm, I'm, I'm penis centered. And it's just, I don't know. Now, now that's a big, that's a fight within itself right there. And that's not even talking about what I really have to deal with. That's not the real problem. But that's a, that turns into a problem. Now I got another problem I'm dealing with. And the real problem not even been, um, it just hasn't been just dealt with at all. It hasn't been addressed, so to speak. And I said, what the fuck do I do? You know, really, what the, you don't understand the, the severity of what I'm dealing with. Right, so you're I fighting got, in yourself. Yeah, it's just, man, please. Let me just not take it, have a couple of my episodes. And since, you know, if I'm not going to be around, let me get all this money. Let me take care of my children. Let me, let me screw as many women as I want. Let me smoke what I want. Let me do what I want. Let me live my life. Because I'm not, I'm not going to let these people just tear me apart. And they, your guys try to label me. You label me a schizoid. You label me a manic depression. You label me a crazy motherfucker. I'm probably more schizoid than I'm in anything. But you label me so many things, you drive a motherfucker insane. You know what I mean? Do you think you talk about you're not going to live long? Do you think you're going to die soon? You think you're going to have a short Listen, life? Life is we're born to die. Why are we afraid of death? Death should be a celebration. But you're riding a fast life. You think huh? it's going to be a short life? We never know. But if it is, boy, I, my, my my short life has been longer than anybody's. I've lived the life of a 90-year-old that's been around the world every day of his life. Let's talk about something you love. You love kids. I've been talking to your friends the last few days in Maui. You do a lot of good things for kids. Why? I don't know. I think I want to have a lot of them. I may have 14. I want to have a lot of kids, yeah. You're four now, right? How many? Five. You're five? Yeah, five. You have a newborn son, I understand, yeah. who's here. Yeah. From a new woman you're dating in Vegas. Yeah. Huh? Um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I don't know. Listen, I don't look, you know what I mean? I, who am I? Look at my mic. I, fuck, look at my life. I mean, I got kids here. I got women here. I got... She's suing me. I can't see my kid from her. She's mad because I have somebody else. It's not like she's been a virgin all her life and she's been pure as white snow. Now I can't have sex with somebody. Well, she let her go have sex with somebody else. Maybe I don't know the whole, the whole organization of conglomeration of this marriage or this legal stuff and stuff. But when I saw Michael Jordan cheat, I just gave up. When he cheated on his wife, I said, fuck it. I ain't gonna ever be faithful to nobody. Because you thought he was the ultimate role model? No, I'm just... 
I don't know what I thought he was. I used to, fuck, if he can do it, I'm gonna do it too. And you know, I've been not having, like I wasn't doing it, but I said, well, I'm gonna do it even more now. You know what I mean? What kind of role model do you think you are for your kids? For my kids? I just give them the real as it is. I understand, I let them know, listen. Do you love your kids? <laughs> Implicitly, but listen. That means I have to lie to them to protect them. They have to know, listen, baby, I love you. Daddy loves you. Daddy will die and kill, but you're a nigger. And the society will treat you like a second-class citizen for the rest of your life. So there's certain things that you mustn't get upset for, but you must fight. You must be a fighter for your people. You mustn't cop out like Daddy did, but you got to keep fighting and keep striving, you know what I mean? Because Daddy copped out because Daddy stopped wanting to be the socialist that he grew up to be and wanted to be greedy. He got caught, I got caught up like everybody. I want to be a capitalist. Being a socialist, helping everybody, that's not going to get me to find the, the badass, fine-ass chick that I want to fuck or be seen with. That's, no, that's not going to do this helping people out. No, I got to help her and play Exclusively, huh? Exclusively. You know what I mean? They're selfish. This is a selfish world. You know, love, if they see me helping somebody, oh, that's great. But how can I get him to help me and exclusively? All that could be with me instead of going to a thousand people or a hundred thousand people. How, come I, how can I get the money of that 2,000 of 20,000 turkeys in my bank account? Why do these people, if they can't get it themselves, if they're not smart enough, if they don't have a Machiavellian approach about it, why should... Why should they get it? They should starve to death. Nobody should give anybody something. They should work for it. I'm willing to work. I'm willing to use my mind, my evil mind, my um, manipulative mind. They you mean, I think you evil. said evil mind. Do you think you're evil? No, I don't think I'm evil, but I think I'm capable of being evil like everyone else. You talk about your family. I talk to some people, obviously, who know you well. And what about your sister, Denise, who died? What about her? She meant a lot to you, right? Yeah, but she's dead. I'll see her soon one day. You think you'll see her soon? One day. We're all going to see you. You want to see whoever died in your family one day, too. What did she mean to you? What kind of an influence was she in your life? She's just a, a good woman that didn't want anything in life, and I just wanted the world. What, what about Camille, your sort of surrogate mom who died Camille recently? was just a woman that's been around the world. She's, she's seen everything from guys like me. as nothing to them. Guys, Camille's been around for 97 years, 98 years. She's seen guys, in her lifetime, she's seen guys like me come and go, loose cannons come and go. You meant a lot to her. Were you sad when she died? No, because she lived a magnificent life. She's been, she been living great her whole entire life. She had a great life. I took care of her whole life. She never paid the bill ever since she knew me. You know what I mean? She was treated like she was even, she was, she was taken care of. She was a young 20-year-old girl being taken care of by a sugar daddy. You know what I mean? She had a great life, and I was glad to be a part of that life because when I was, when I was unfortunate and I was unable to help myself, she helped me. And I felt as a return and a payback, I should help her until she died. Mike Tyson's sister, Denise, died in 1990 of a heart attack when she was in her 20s. He was very close to her. His surrogate mother, Camille, died last year. His biological mother died when he was just 16. When we come back, we'll have Tyson's response to his own comments in the interview that you just saw about the latest biting incident. Stay tuned. As you just heard in our interview, Mike Tyson admitted to biting Lennox Lewis during a press conference in January. Aware that this interview was going to run today, last night Tyson released this statement about the comments that he made to us saying, quote, I said I bit Lennox because that is what everyone wanted to hear. I will say anything to get under his skin. But on June 8th, flesh will not be enough. I will take Lennox's title, his soul, and smear his pompous brains all over the ring when I hit him. We have more now of my explosive interview with Mike Tyson. Again, I want to remind you that these are Mike Tyson's own words. Some are explicit and may not be suitable for young people. You're a boxing historian. What kind of legacy do you want to leave behind? You know boxing so well. So many people don't, I don't think realize how smart you are with boxing, current events. You and I talked about Middle I East. But listen, right, the fact is that um, it doesn't really matter no more. I crossed, I, I crossed that... Um, I crossed that line where I don't care anymore. You know, I, mean, I won't accept a not, uh, I won't accept um, introduction in no Hall of Fame. You know what I mean? I won't accept it because I don't respect those people because they don't respect me. If you're a Hall of Fame person, you have the, the respect of the society. You should you should be able to see. Are these people idiots? Do they see the overt racism or do they see the overt biasness that I deal with in my life? And no one comes and I fought, I fought it all alone. You know what I mean? 
I'm surprised I'm not suicidal. I haven't killed myself, but I wouldn't do that. I prefer to kill someone else than to kill myself. How do you want to be remembered? Just remembered. Just remembered. It's up to people what they think about me. Do you care what people think? No, nah, at one time, yeah, you know, but hey, listen, I didn't, I never won any beauty contests or anything. I never accomplished anything about what someone thought about me, you know. Do you care what your kids think about you, though? Well, they have no choice. I feed them. You know what I mean? I feed them, I clothe them, I take care of them. If I'm Charles Manson, they better love me. And they will love me because it's just, um, it's common sense to love your benefactor. Mike, thank you so much. Iron Mike Tyson, we report, you decide. We now turn to sports historian and co-author of Sting Like a Bee, the Muhammad Ali story, Bert Sugar, who's here with me in studio, and in Las Vegas, boxing attorney, Lawrence Epstein. Thank you so much, gentlemen, both of you, for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Bert, let's talk uh, with you first, if we could. What was your reaction, first of all, to the interview and the fact that he said, look on camera, yes, I did bite him? Well, first of all, Mike Tyson is a very, very, very smart person. And I, I've always said that, and you've got evidence thereof. And yes, he did bite him. And I think that uh, for the unique way that, and I compliment you on getting it out of him, but it was even funnier that his camp, Team Tyson, whatever their name is, uh, came out, or in his words, theoretically came out, with a comment that sort of declined and denied it. Uh, you know, it's, it's typical because you have an iffy proposition. There are still people in Memphis who do not believe that this fight will happen. Could this jeopardize the fight then, potentially, Bert? I think anything can jeopardize it. It's that precarious, and I think that conceivably it could. And the people down in Tunica, uh, the Tunica, Mississippi casinos are still wary that it may or may not happen. It's an over-under for them. So that a comment like that might well jeopardize the fight, and that's why they spun that nice little statement that wasn't written by Mike Tyson. Lauren Epstein, what's your, uh, what's your response to this, Lawrence? Well, I agree with Bert. First of all, I think Mike Tyson is definitely a smart guy, but I think this interview, uh, in my mind, validates the actions of the Nevada Athletic Commission. Uh, a lot of people here in Nevada were, I think, upset with the commission's decision not to grant Mike Tyson a license. Clearly, there was going to be tremendous economic benefit to having an event like this in Las Vegas. But uh, when you read an interview like this and you combine it with all the things that Mike's done in the past, from the ear biting to the, the criminal convictions to, you know, the biting at the press conference, I think there's no doubt that the regulators here in Nevada made the right but very tough decision. What do you think is next then um, from a legal standpoint? I'd love to hear your perspective first, Bert, and then Lawrence from you. Well, I think the fight will go on. I mean, but we're not assured of that until both men climb in the ring. Uh, I do also feel, though, that Mike Tyson is playing to the press. He will say whatever it is that reinforces his bad guy image. It's sort of Mickey Rourke-esque, because he is a tabloid creature right now, not just a boxing creature. And he even said it in his own words in, at, at Maui. He said, I know it irritates you when I come off sounding like a Neanderthal or a babbling idiot. Ergo, he's going to do it again and again. And we play to it. Unfortunately, there's some like me who won't, if you'll excuse the pun, I won't bite. But by the same token, Mike plays this and plays it well, and he's playing the press. And we, you've got one of the few purest answers I've ever heard Mike give, because usually around the press, he jumps up and down like Rumpelstiltskin. Yeah, I would say I felt he was very genuine with me and very sort of forthright. And also, and you and I just talked about this, Bert, too, I also felt that he was also uh, very human in the perspective and very sort of uh, comfortable. He can be that. There, there are so many, and he even admitted it, and when he said that you could be an aunt, you could be a, a, a sister, a daughter, uh, there are so many Mike Tysons that I think sometimes he, gets, he can get a group discount from the American Psychiatric Association. All right, and we'll continue more with our discussion after this. Now's the time. And I'm curious to see what he'll do after boxing. I, I'm really am. Uh, because I know he can't go get a regular job. I know he can't probably run a big corporate company because go, it's going to be a party. You know, Mike will probably open a strip club, a chain of strip clubs, and just have fun and live, man. Yeah. Chain of strip clubs. Welcome back to Foxwire. <laughs> the life of a boxer can be a short one, so just what will Mike Tyson do when his time in the ring is over? We continue now with our discussion with sports historian Bert Sugar. Bert, what do you see for his future? Well, I, rem I am reminded of Larry Holmes' comment, and he made it about 10 years ago, and he said, in 10 years, Mike Tyson's not going to be alive. 
Well, and Mike Tyson himself in the interview here, I, I said, know. look, do you think you're going to have a short life? He said, look, if I die tomorrow, basically, I've lived the life of a nine-year-old. Nine -year -old. It's been a full life. And it has been for Mike. I mean, he's done everything, and he's still here. Fourteen years later, he's still here, and people actually have given him a very good chance of winning the title for the third time. And here's a man who, as you point out, he has had a full life. I mean, he's been on antidepressants. He was telling me that he's been on Zoloft on and off. We understand that th there's a question whether he'll be on it right during the fight. Well, I talked to someone from Showtime, he'll go unnamed, and they said that they wondered in their own mind's eye as to whether they weren't being morally irresponsible by taking him off medication to put him in the ring. So there always, there's always also that question. I mean, this whole fight is not just a, a fight or an event. To some people, it's a train wreck waiting to happen. To some people, it's a serial that they want to watch. But it's going to be get eyeballs, and it also has moral problems, and it has Mike Tyson. Which is always fiery. Let's bring in Lawrence Ty uh, Epstein, if we could, who's still there in Vegas with us. Lawrence, we just talked about also the medication issue. I thought Burp just brought up a good point. If he's not on medication at the time of the fight, is there sort of even a moral issue, maybe for his promoters and other people, taking him off specifically for the fight? You know, th there's definitely a possibility of that. I think that's, you know, to get back to the Nevada Athletic Commission, I think when they were considering this situation and looking at Mike Tyson, they were, I think, primarily looking out for the best interest of Mike Tyson, both from a mental and a physical standpoint. And, you know, is it, is it right, is it medically safe to take somebody off medication who needs that medication for the purpose of uh, fighting in a boxing match? I don't know the answer to that question, but it's definitely a significant one. And it's interesting, Bert, too. I think what we also gained from this interview is who is Mike Tyson? I mean, he really says, look, I feel like I'm the lowest of the low. And I said to him, look, but you're making millions of dollars. A lot of people would kill to have the money and, and, and all the people helping him mm. and all this. Uh, but he says, no, this is well, what makes him low. Well, he's built up a wall, almost a guard all shield, if you're that old to remember that commercial, and, uh, away from people because several people have used him and abused him mentally and just stolen money from him. So he has set that up, but he's very defensive about himself. Mike is a sensitive person, and he turns that outwards. Mm -hmm. He just shouts at people. I mean, and, and, it's, and it's, yes, he's out of control, but he knew what he, was, he went in to do, whether he gets out of control or not. But Mike Tyson is a bottom line, how's he going to be remembered, almost as a sad person. And I think you saw parts of that in your interview. Yeah, I was very sad after the interview. I said, this, this is really a lonely guy who feels like he's being used at every corner. And he has been. And he certainly has. Lawrence Epstein, is this sort of typical for a boxer? You're a boxing attorney. Is this sort of also sort of unfortunately part of the game? There are a lot of people coming at him, a lot of people who want a piece of Mike Tyson. You know, I think it is. I generally don't represent fighters. I tend to represent promoters in my practice, but uh, obviously have a tremendous amount of interaction with fighters. And, you know, this is, is part of the whole culture of boxing, so to speak. You've got, uh, you know, a lot of fighters coming from tough circumstances, and they're surrounding themselves with tough people, and there's just a lot of problems that result from this whole culture of boxing. And uh, we also hear the background of Mike Tyson, particularly Bert. I think one thing that's interesting, he went, he grew up basically in a juvenile detention center, tough streets of Brooklyn, he talked about. Uh, Steve Lockett, his mm, good friend Steve there, Lock, talked about yes. some of the tough times that they went through growing up in the teens. And yet, uh, I can't excuse all of that because while he grew up in the projects, his brother Rodney is a pharmacist in Los Very Angeles. Very successful, exactly. So Mike makes his own problems. I don't think there's any question about that. But somehow they grow out of control, and Mike now trusts nobody and has set up this defensive mechanism, which he now turns on the world, and I'm surprised you got that interview. Well, th and Steve Epstein, I'd like to ask you, too, <laughs> what, what do you expect, too, for Mike Tyson if he wins, if he loses this fight? Let's talk about the two hypotheticals. Um, I, first of all, I believe there's going to be a rematch, regardless of what happens. I you think, think regardless, and why I, is that? Well, I think, uh, at least my understanding, that contractually uh, there's a requirement that, regardless of what happens, uh, they're going to do a rematch for this fight. And so Bert shaking his head. Why, no, why Bert? No, it's not in the contract. Okay. It, it may happen because the fight was so good or they bought so many th millions of eyeballs that it's profitable. But there's no such agreement. And well, Steve, go ahead. Point two. Anyway, I think that uh, if the fight is, is anything uh, close and, and, and possibly controversial, I think you'll probably see a rematch for this fight. Now, the, the one point I make to that, he talks controversial, is in England, the bookies, and it's a legal profession over there, have established at four to one odds that there will be a disqualification in this fight. By Tyson or by Lewis? By, well, by either, but the obvious in inference is Tyson. 
Meaning what? Um, maybe a bite, ear biting a, a, a incident? A hit after the bell, a, a try to break an arm, a knockdown of a referee. You name it, he's done it. So they, they're covering all bases. But well, let's see what Mixed happens. metaphor. Should be interesting. <laughs> we'll be watching June 8th. Burst Sugar, Lawrence Epstein, thank you both very much. Thank you. And coming up next... Are wearing white